Seven, the science of God realization, I think it's called. Okay. The science of God. And today we are on chapter seven. What Pallad learned in the womb. And I think it's text fifty, although the book is on fifty-five. It's text fifty. Oh, I see it happened. The wind blew up. So please repeat. Deva, Asura, Manusha, Va, Devo Suya, Manusha, Va, Yaksha, Gandharva, Eva, Va, Yaksho Gandharva Eva Gandharva Eva Va Yaksho Bhajan Mukunda Charanam Bhajan Mukunda Charanam Swastimam Shat Yata Vayam Swastimam Shad Yata Vayam Devo Suro Manasyo Iva Yaksho Gandharva Eva Va Bhajan Mukunda Charanam Sastimam Shad Yata Vayam Devo Suryo Manu Shoiva Yaksho Gandhava Eva Va Bhajan Mukunda Charanam Sastimam Shad Yata Vayam Deva, a demigod, Asura, a demon, Manusha, a human being, Va, or Yaksha, a, yes, Yaksha, there we go, easy, a Yaksha. A member of the demoniac species. Gandharva. A Gandharva. Eva. Indeed. Va. Or. Bhajan. Rendering service. Mukunda Charanam. To the lotus feet of Mukunda, Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna. Who can give who can give liberation? Swastimam full of all auspiciousness. Shat becomes Yata just as Vayam we Palad Maharaj. Translation and purport by his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. If a demigod, demon, human being, yaksha, gandharva, or anyone within this universe renders service to the lotus feet of Mukunda, who can, deli who can deliver liberation, he is actually situated 
in the most auspicious condition of life, exactly like us, the Mahajans headed by Pallad Maharaj. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Pallad Maharaj, by his living example, requested his friends to engage in devotional service. Whether in demigod society, Asura society, human society, or Gandharva society, every living entity should take shelter of the lotus feet of Mukunda and thus become perfect in good fortune. Siddha Prabhupada Ki Jai. Om Ajnanta Miranda Shajananjana Shalakaya Chakshura Minitam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha We are born in the darkness of ignorance, our spiritual masters opening our heart with the torchlight of knowledge, and therefore we offer our most humble and respectful obeisances in the dust of his lotus feet. <coughs> Deva Devo Suyar Manasova Yaksh Yakshogandarva Evava Bhajan Mukunda Charanam Swastimam Shat Yatavayam. If a demigod, demon, human being, Yaksha, Gandharva, or anyone within this universe renders service to the lotus feet of Mukunda, who can deliver liberation, he is actually situated in the most auspicious condition of life, exactly like us the Mahajans, headed by Sri Palan. So where are we? Uh, this um, canto, this part of the Bhagavatam, um, I decided yesterday just to read a little bit back, and then I ended up going a little bit further back, and a little bit further back, almost read, ended up reading the whole canto. It was so exciting. It was so enlivening to the heart. Um, of course, we know the history. The history is that um, devas and demigod, demigods and demons are always having difficulty between themselves. Who should be in charge? Anybody ever notice that around this world? Who should be, everybody's wondering who should be in charge. Anybody feel like they should be in charge and somebody else shouldn't be in charge? I mean, this is the nature of the material world. Um, there's always com competition for supremacy. And this is a diff makes everything very difficult. <coughs> so in the case, we know, Ranika Shipu, he um, became very disturbed when his brother was killed. He right? became very disturbed and caused havoc in the universe. Actually, he took control. And then he decided to take up a little program of austerity to really become in control. He just really wanted... It was like, uh, in America, I always keep saying, next level. Let's get to the next level. He wanted to go to the next level. He wanted immortality, which no one has ever achieved in this material world on a material level. No one has ever achieved immortality, but he was, he desired it so much, he performed austerities which were unimaginable, inconceivable austerities, which Arendika Shipu underwent, just to achieve a material goal. And we should remember that as this class goes on, because as one is willing to endeavor so strenuously just to achieve some flickering material situation. As His Grace Panchagoda was explaining so nicely yesterday that everything here is temporary. Nasato vijite bhavo nabo vijite satta. That which is material is temporary and that which is spiritual is eternal. Yet we strive so much for this material uh, success. So Pallad's father, he decided that I'm going for immortality. And he went and performed great austerities. And of course, he caused great disturbance to the entire universe to the point where Lord Brahma had to come and ask him what's going on. What is, what is, I mean, the whole universe was catching on fire. 
And um, he said, I want immortality. And Brahma says, I cannot give that which I do not possess. I cannot give that which I do not possess. So then we know the story. He asked for this benediction and that benediction and this benediction and that one and this one, that one, this one, that one, on and on and on. Brahma says, so be it, so be it, so be it. Let it be, let it be. And then Haranyakashipu, of course, then considered that he had covered all the bases. I guess that's not an appropriate mission in America. He covered all angles. Okay. Covered all angles. He had all angles covered. He thought for sure nothing can kill me. I'm immortal. And he went like this. I'll explain this later. Just remind me to explain this later. Andrew Kashipu, yes, I'm immortal, right? Because this also has to do with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we know the story. Pallad Maharaj, um, at, when Haranyakashipu went to perform these austerities, the demigods took advantage of the situation because the leader of the demons was no longer available to give direction. And so the demigods became very, very powerful and they over, overturned the demons. And the demons had to retreat, but once Haranyakashipu came back, the demons got fired up. Our captain of, of our team is back, we're ready to go. And they did, they took control, and the demigods had to go into hiding. And when Haranyakashipu was doing his, performing his austerities and the demigods took over, they um, captured the, the uh, palace of Haranyakashipu and his wife. Uh, what was his wife's name? Yadu. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have it written down on a piece of paper in my notebook, but I forgot to bring my notebook up here. Put, can you bring my notebook and put it here? That way I'll refer to it and forget where I'm at. Um, anyway, his wife and the demigods, I mean, this is, we have to consider the seriousness of the situation because the demigods captured Ranyakashipu's wife and they had a plan to kill the child as soon as it was born. This doesn't happen very often in uh, demigod society. Demigods don't usually think, let's kill a kid. Just another, assuming that the kid is a demon. In my life, I've uh, uh, accepted a humanist, not part of my Krishna consciousness, but I've adapted it to Krishna consciousness. And it begins with prajalpa. That means speaking impeccably. Speaking in such a way <laughs> that the person that you're speaking, know, uh, speaking to can make no assumptions about where you stand. So therefore there are no assumptions and you speak in such a way that the person replies that you will make, not, you'll make no assumptions of that person. So you have these first two things, impeccable speaking and making no assumptions. Then the third thing is always do your very best. Always do your very best in whatever you're doing. The topmost the topmost level of what you can do. Be on your game at every day, at every time, at every moment. One day, it may be, one day it may be just a little bit, someday it may be a lot, but whatever that day brings you, whatever opportunity you have been given, whatever facility we've been given that day, we use it to our utmost ability. And then we don't worry about what people who don't have our best interest in mind say these four principles. If someone has your best interest in mind, then it makes a difference. But if someone doesn't really have your best interest in mind and only wants to break the first rule of impeccable speech and just do pajalpa, then what is the value of that opinion? So then going back to Harandikashipu, so I don't get lost. So anyway, the demons, they made the assumption. I mean, the demigods made an, a wrong assumption. They assumed that because the, the seed that was planted into the womb of this lady was planted by literally the greatest demon that ever existed, the only possibility of this child coming out was that it was going to be a demon, and therefore we should kill it. Wrong assumption. Wrong assumption. And the person who doesn't make assumptions, 
who is one of the greatest authorities in the universe, Narada Muni came and he said, you're making an assumption. You think that the seed in this woman's womb is a demon, but the seed in this woman's womb is one of the greatest devotees that has ever appeared in this world, confirmed by the bell. Greatest, one of the greatest devotees who's ever appeared in this material world is, is residing within the womb of the wife of the greatest demon. Just see the dichotomy here. See the dichotomy. So, it's a nice lesson to be learned because the, de the demigods, upon hearing from the authority of Narada Muni, they just immediately accept it because they understand him to be a spiritual authority and therefore there's no need to really inquire. You can inquire submissively, but one, one meets someone who has impeccable spiritual character and is, exhibits a symptoms of self-realization. Then that person, when he speaks, Shishi Gornitai Ki Jai, Krishna Balaram Ki Jai, Shishi Radhe Shamalita Devi Shakadevi Ki Jai. Then you just accept. One who has implicit faith in Krishna and the spiritual master can render devotional service to so the demigods. They are like that. They have that type of faith when they know that Narada Muni shows up and says, Don't do this, do this. They just immediately did. And so Narada Muni took Pallad Mother's, Pallad Maharaja's wife, Kayadu, I wrote it down, Kayadu, to his ashram. And in that ashram, he gave all instructions and spiritual knowledge to the lady, Kayadu. But Pallad Maharaj in the womb, and he heard, he heard all these instructions. Interesting to note that uh, Yayadu didn't want the child to take birth without the protection of her husband, so she, the child stayed within the womb for the duration of time that she desired. This is the power of certain living entities within this world. We go outside the realm of physics or all these material sciences and um, go to the next level, I'll say. So Pallad Maharaj, he heard all these instructions, deep, deep spiritual instructions given by Narada Muni to his mother within the womb. And when Harandri Kashipu finished his um, austerities and was given this unbelievably surcharged material body with great power, resumed his demoniac activities, she gave birth to this boy Pallad. And Pallad, from the very beginning of his life, was a devotee, showed all kinds of symptoms um, that manifest only in, in great souls. And so when it came time for him to enter into school, Gurukula, huh? what was the name of his teachers? Anybody remember? Raise your hand. What was the name of his teachers? I'm just seeing if everybody's paying awake. If you ask a question to the class, then you get the attention back, you know? Uh, Sananda. Sananda and Amar. Sananda and Amar. Sananda and Amar. Amar, yeah. So he went to a guru call, and the guru call teachers were trying to train him up on how to become a demon. This is your friend. This is your enemy. This is the goal of life. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you may die. Just go for it. Huh? In America, when I was a young man, they had an ad on television, grab all the gusto you can because you don't know when it's going to end, right? Just grab it all. Just take. What was the name of it? There was one famous person in, our, in the Vedic history, beg, borrow, or steal somehow, or they get ghee. Huh? Travaka Muni, yeah. No matter what, just get ghee, because you get ghee, you can enjoy. In other words, the whole purpose of life is to enjoy. This is the whole goal, enjoy. So Pallad Maharaj went to this school, and anybody here go to school? Raise your hand. Anybody ever go to school? Only five people went to school, nobody else. Raise your hand if you went to school. You didn't go to school? Okay. You didn't go to school? Okay. Okay. Whenever we're in school, 
I remember being in school. Actually, I shouldn't have been in school because I wasn't qualified, but that's another story for another day. So whenever we're in school, the only thing I could think of was when is playtime. During the study period, I'm just thinking, when is recess? When just looking at the clock, tick, 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 trying to get to the, to the playtime. Same thing happened with Pallad and his little demon associates, right? The time for playtime arrived. And the kids said, hey, Pallad, the teachers aren't around. The teachers are gone. They've, they, they've gone off for, what is it, tiffin time, huh? They've gone off for having a little tea, whatever. So we're free, we can do whatever we want, let's go play. And Pallad says, well, I have a little story to talk about. I have a little something I'd like to bring up, and that is, uh, I heard this information a long time ago, and he starts talking about the purpose of life, Swartagatim, and that life is meant for Bhagavad Dharma, to understand the absolute truth. There's a very wonderful lecture, if you ever get a chance, I think at 71, 72, Srila Prabhupada doing the Bhagavad Dharma discourses in New Vrindavan. And he was telling all the disciples, and, and there were many guests, it was a very wonderful festival. Um, and he was talking about this Bhagavad Dharma, or the purpose of life, to understand our, who we are, what our relationship is to the Supreme Personality of God, and how to act in such a way that we can attain that goal. So Pallad Maharaj began to speak all this information to his students. He says, life is very, very serious. He said, the first 10 years, you just, you just mess around as a kid. You don't really do anything. You're just a kid and you just do kid things. Of course, you know the story. And he said, you spend so much time sleeping. Of course, the first thing he said was, you spend 12 hours sleeping. That's the mode of ignorance, by the way. If not, there's some people, um, anyway, in the Bhagavad Gita it says that if you sleep more than six hours, you're, you're, you've achieved the mode of ignorance. I've been quite successful in that endeavor, but um, we should control our sleeping a little bit. So Pallad says the first, first half, like one half of your life spent sleeping. So say we sleep eight hours as a modern scientist say we should do, it's one third of your life, it's just done. Okay, I'll tell a little story. I was flying from Gainesville, Florida, Alachua. You probably heard of Gainesville, you may not have. And going to LA because at one point I was a member of the BBT um, Advisory Council. We didn't get, we just make gave advice. I don't know what happened. And so I'm sitting in the airport in transit and there's a newspaper next to me. And so I went into Maya and I opened up the newspaper and there was an article. What does it take to do, what does it take in life to do everything that the experts say we're supposed to do to become whole in our life? So it says you must sleep eight hours, you must work eight hours, you must exercise one hour, you must be with your wife and ch children together for one hour, you must be with your wife alone for one hour, you must be with your children for an hour, you must exercise for an hour, you must have some personal time, you must have this. And by the time the article was over, it takes 47 hours to, have a whole, to become a whole person in this material world. You need 47 hours, according to the experts, to, de to develop a type of consciousness where you're actually feeling whole in your life. They did not include any spirituality, which was the missing link in their philosophy. Right? So Pallad Maharaj went through a basic, uh, I mean the article said you spend like five years just brushing your teeth. And you know, if you consider every action that we do, it takes time. So Pallad Maharaj explained all these things to his, all his classmates, and at the end, the classmates said, whoa. Where did you learn all that from? How, did you sneak out of the ashram in the middle of the night and break out of your father's, like, I mean, his father was the, you know, he was Hiranyakashipu. He had, like, total control, you know, what do you call that? A disorder. He had, like, a mental disorder. He had to be totally in control of everything at all time, all place, under all circumstances. His father was a demon. He certainly wouldn't let his child sneak out in the middle of the night. So the kids asked, well, whoa, whoa, how'd this happen? Where'd you get all this? This is really interesting. Where'd you, where did you learn all this? And so that's where we're at today. 
We're in chapter 7, where Pallad, in the beginning of this chapter, explains that here's what happened. My father went to perform austerities. The Demite gods took over. They, they beat up all the demons, and they were going to kill my mother. But then the Narada Muni showed up and saved my mother, and I got to hear all this really interesting stuff in the womb of my mother. And then, so he, he tells the whole story very briefly. When it comes to talking about himself, it was very brief. Just to maybe 20, 30, 20 verses, 25 verses. And then again, he begins to give them information, more information than they gave in the chapter before. He starts to give more information, more spiritual knowledge, more reasons why one should take up the process of Krishna consciousness, the urgency. When we say this word urgency, it's very nice because we learn this from Bhagavad Gita. Several places in the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada says that from the very beginning of one, one should take up Krishna consciousness from the very beginning of one's life. And then in one place only, he says that one should take up Krishna consciousness from the very beginning of life or from the point that one understands the urgency of the message. Because there's a certain urgency to the message that is being given in spiritual instruction. It's a, there's an urgency that's there. And this is what happened when Srila Prabhupada came to the West. I don't want to extend the too long, but you couldn't have more of a perfect timing for Srila Prabhupada to enter into America than 1965. America, it was just like a ripe fruit sitting on the tree, dripping with nectar and sweet juice. It was, it was, it was equal, it was like, um, segreg I don't know, do they have segregation here? Segregation huh? was, was a, just starting. The anti-Vietnam War was happening, women's rights were happening, all these things were happening, and the youth, the young people of America were, were making demands and making, just getting into it. And Prabhupada came right when everyone was just kind of like, we don't want what we've had before. We want something better. We want something more out of our lives. We want something greater. And Prabhupada came with the mercy. The mercy was that simply taking up this process of Krishna consciousness, you'll become happy. You can't become happy. You cannot become satisfied outside the realm of spiritual endeavor. It just doesn't happen. So Pallad Maharaj instructs more and more and more of these things. And so now we get to today's verse, which is almost the end of the chapter. He's giving all these instructions. And so he comes to the point where Pallad is explaining that even if one is a demigod, or one's a demon, a human being, a yaksha, a gandharva, or anyone within this universe renders service at the lotus feet of Mukunda, the giver of liberation, is actually situated in the most auspicious condition of life, like us, he says, like us. So here is the important um, point of this purport. P the Prabhupada says, Pallad Maharaj, by his living example, by his living example, requested his friends to engage in devotional service. And this is what attracted us, was Srila Prabhupada's living example. The living example of a Vaishnava, a pure devotee of the Lord. One who has depth of spiritual knowledge, an understanding that goes beyond just the mundane. Because basically religion in the material world now is just looking to become comfortable or to become um, better off materially. We have to actually go to a deeper level where we are willing to give, just like we were discussing earlier, where Haranyakashipu was willing to sacrifice for immortality like no one had ever sacrificed before. But if you really want to sacrifice, there's a saying that, you know, sacrifice a child for the family, a family for the village, a village for the whatever, and then sacrifice yourself for, for becoming self-realized. In other words, we really, we really have an opportunity here, a golden opportunity, to actually advance in spiritual life 
under proper guidance. Throughout this whole teaching, which Prahlad Maharaj is giving to his friends, he always emphasizes proper teaching, proper instruction, a proper guide. Someone who can actually give the information so that we can actually assimilate that information and understand that information. But once we get this information, it is incumbent upon every person who gains this information to distribute this information. Because there is, we know these two words, gyan, vigyan. Gyan is there. Gyan means knowledge. And we gain knowledge by, by studying the scriptures, engaging in our devotion. We, get, we gain this gyan, we gain this understanding. But for it to become realized knowledge, vigyan, one, it's almost impossible to get unless one shares that knowledge with others. When one begins to share the knowledge they receive with others, that, that gyan, that knowledge begins to what do you call it, go deeper into the heart and becomes realized knowledge that you actually realize that I'm not this material body, I'm spirit, soul, I'm part and parcel of Krishna. I have something other to, something greater to accomplish in this life than just material acquisitions, than just material name and fame, which will just diminish. It will just diminish over time. It may last one generation, two generations, three generations may last 10 generations, but it's, it's temporary. This information is very, very interesting. So this story of Pallad Maharaj telling his, 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 his students that all these things about uh, the changing of the body. Huh? That don't worry, huh? this body is changing in every moment. We're gonna have, I always give the example, I remember being like a little tiny boy three or four years old and I wanted a tri I had a tricycle and that was my mode of transportation, had a three-wheeler, right? And at a certain age I thought, oh, I need a two-wheeler. If I get a two-wheeler, then I'll be happy. Then at a certain age I wanted a four-wheeler, I wanted a car, then I'll be happy, you know? At what point does it end? Huh? As the body changes, hmm? and as a young man I had certain desires, and I'm an old man, I have certain desires. It's just always gonna be there. And the, yes, yes, two days ago I was reading in the Bhagavad Gita and it says that as long as one has a material body, one will have material desires. You cannot get away from them. Desires are going to be there. But for the Krishna conscious person, he utilizes those desires in the service of the Lord. That one may restrict themselves from certain activities and even though the taste may remain in the heart, but giving those things up and engaging in a positive, a positive uh, action. The analogy should the Prabhupada gives is that if a child has some, some article or some, something in their hand that may cause damage, say a knife or some, something sharp in their hand, if you go to take it away, the child will move really quickly and could harm themselves. But if you just dangle something that the child will be attracted to in front of them, the child will automatically give up the dangerous thing. In the same way, devotional service is like that. Devotional service has the ability to give us a sense of happiness, a sense of wholeness that doesn't take 47 hours. It, doesn't, it, it, it can happen instantaneously if we surrender our heart. There's a part in the Bhagavad Gita that, or in the purport, or Srila Prabhupada said, if one just declares to Krishna, from this day forward, I am yours, at that point, one is liberated. At that point, one is actually given liberation. One is given you know, freedom from the clutches of material energy. This is a victory. We have this, we have this opportunity to become victorious. This is what Harani Kashipu did when he got his body. Remember, I was gonna tell you about this right here, right? This is victory. Huh? You ever see the devotees, when they go before the deities, they go like this? Huh? Whenever they say, Shri Prabhupada, ki jai, up go the arms, right? It's the victorious uh, body language. There's body language. I've explained this to several people. There's body language. Uh, you can tell where someone's at just by how their body is. You can tell if someone's telling the truth by their facial expressions. 
I was a girl cool teacher. You had to learn these things. <laughs> and so it's described that, uh, say, for example, you're running a race. And you run the race, you run the race, you run the race, and you're the first one to cross the, the line. What do you do? Show me what you do. Everybody, show me what you do. When you cross the line, you're the first one to cross the line. What do you do? You sit there on the floor and do nothing? What do you do? You sit, you like, like, huh? Come on, show me what you do. Everybody. You like, yeah. Okay. Now I'll tell you a little story because all classes are supposed to have stories. People who cannot see that are blind. I don't know if you can use that if it's politically correct anymore. People who are blind and have never seen anybody go like this in their life because they're blind. If they compete in some activity, if they win, they go like this. This is a power pose. This is a power. This, 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 means that, just like if you see somebody sitting like this, you know this guy's got it in control, right? You walk into the, you know, where the desk is situated in the office, to how you're sitting in, the, I can't put my feet up on the desk here, but if you really got the feet up, then you're really in charge, right? How we, po how we position ourselves, right? How we position ourselves. And so the glory of Krishna consciousness is that we go every day, and, and in the mood of Lord Chaitanya, we spread this Krishna conscious movement, this victory movement. Huh? It's part of, well, glory, the victory. Chaito Dharpana Marjanam Bhava Maha. It's a victory, victory. We win. What do we win? We win from the cycle of birth and death and old age and disease. We pull ourselves out of that situation simply by the act of surrender. The word surrender, papajante, in the, in the Gita, so the Prabhupada translate, translates it as surrender. Papajante means to move forward. So each and every, like papajante, padayatra, papajante, each and every day, we move forward towards Krishna. And any endeavor, and again, we go back to those four principles, no pajalpa, no assumption, always do your best. Don't worry about those who don't care about you say. We go to those things, we just move forward and we always do our best that day. Always do our best. And as we do our best, neha bi karmanastati, prachavayo and the say that a little endeavor, even the littlest insignificant endeavor that one makes in this effort for Krishna consciousness can protect one. The other day I was reading, and it's getting a little like, I want to wait, time for question. I read, I read the Gita a lot. I like the Gita. It's, for me, it's like medicine. And so in the Gita, it was explaining that, um, that Krishna conscious, I think it's Apichet Chudro, in that verse, um, it's described that someone may be, um, what would you say, engaged in devotional service or become part of a society that, engra that, that engages in devotional service, but it's just kind of lackadaisical. See the body language? Huh? You see it? You can feel it. Just by seeing me, like, you know, now I feel like I'm a loser, right? Like a la or a lazy person. You know, like lackadaisical. You become lackadaisical. You become, you know, you just don't put your whole effort in it. But even if a little bit, even like a little speck, a little morsel, a little atomic particle of you has like a little interest, Krishna sees it, Krishna notices it, and Krishna amplifies it. And the next day you can get maybe two molecules. And the next day three, pretty soon you got a simple cell organism. A simple cell Krishna bhakti organism residing in your brain and moving forward in Krishna consciousness. And when we give this information, you'll be surprised how interested people are in this information. The simple knowledge that we have, the simple knowledge that we're not this body is outstanding information for an ordinary person. I'll tell just a quick story because all lectures are supposed to have stories. That's my third story, so. I'm, I'm sure many of you know Giriraj Swami. Giriraj Swami Ki Jai. I mean, 
the love I have for that person is, I, I just, anyway, we're very close friends. So I'm at his house, his family gave him a, a home, his family property, he lives in California. So it's, it's in an area that's kind of mountainous, not mountain, but hills, and so I have a cell phone. And my cell phone wasn't working. Now imagine a sannyasi without a cell phone. I mean, that's, that's like the greatest pain that any sannyasi could ever experience, right? Because my cell phone's going from one tower to the other and it doesn't know which tower to go to, right? So it's flipping back and forth, the cell phone's flipping. So I get on a landline, a primitive form of communication, right? I get on the landline and I call my cell phone company, AT&T, I'm probably not known here. And I tell them what's going on. And so the lady, she says, okay, let me call your number. So she calls my number and she runs it through the computer and through the computer they figure out how to make it just stay on one tower. It takes like an hour and 15 minutes for them to get this done. So I'm talking to this lady the whole time. And then at the end, she says, well, do you have any other questions? Never ask a Hare Krishna that question. Right? I said, well, not about my phone, but I do have one existential question that happened to me about four o'clock this morning. She said, go ahead, ask it. I said, well, I woke up this morning about four o'clock and I looked, turned on the light in the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I saw this guy that was 60 years old. This is five years ago now. I'm 65 this year. So I said, I see this guy in the mirror that's 60 years old. I'm looking at him and I go, where did this guy come from? I said, I remember looking in the mirror and being three or four or five years old and thinking that was me. I remember being like 10 years old looking in the mirror and I thought that was me. I remember being 20 years old in the mirror looking in the mirror and thinking, whoa, wow, that's good, that's really me. I remember looking in the mirror at 40 years old and saying, what's going on? I said, I looked in the mirror today and I thought, uh-oh, it's over. I said, so I said, you know, I can't figure out which body I am. You know, I, I, you know, it, I remember being in the five-year-old body, the 10-year-old body, the 20-year-old body, the 40-year-old body, and I thought that was me and this was me and that was me. I said, obviously I can't be this body. I must be just the conscious observer inside this body. Which is what one of the things that Pallad Maharaj says, we're the conscious observers in the body. I said, I must be just the conscious observer inside this body because the body is changing at every moment. I'm staying the same person. I'm just existing in this body. But I think that I'm a person. I feel like I have like a personality. Some people may like it. Some people may not like it. See the hands? Like it, don't like it. They may like it. They may not like it. I said, but I have a personality. And if I'm coming from something, that which I come from must also have personality. So I said, I'm trying to figure out what my relationship is to that person, that creative personality which I come from, which must be a supreme entity. So could you please help me understand that and get to that point of understanding this level of, uh, of existence? And she goes, oh my God, that's like, you know, it's like the OMG, you know, oh my God. She said, that's the most interesting thing I've ever heard. She said, I've been changing my body all my life too. <laughs> I can't answer your question, but I said, she said, I'd really like to know why. I said, well, you got my email on there because, you know, you have to put your email address in. And I said, you can just send me a note. I said, I've been studying this for about 50 years. We can have a nice conversation. And uh, it went from there. So even the simple, basic, you know, first verses of the second chapter where Krishna is starting to instruct Arjuna will blow away the mind. Or, you know, well, yeah, what would you say? And that's American. Uh, they'll, they'll yeah, blow away the mind. It, it'll, it'll just Stop. send, huh? Stop. Yeah, the astounded. Thank you, Krishna. I mean, it'll just astound an, an ordinary person, you know. You're not this body. It's just like, and there's always an opportunity to, to share Krishna consciousness. Just like sometimes I'm allowed, most sannyasis aren't allowed to do anything, but sometimes I'm allowed to go to the store and buy some groceries. And so when they go through the checkout counter, the person robotically says, and how, how are you today, sir? And, I, and most people say, fine. I go, well, I'm kind of stuck in this cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease, and I'm trying to find my way out. And they go, huh? And I say, well, yeah, you know, I'm, like this, I'm in this thing where I took birth, and I, you know, I'm, I'm always getting sick, and I'm, I'm 
you know, look at me. I got gray hair since I was 30 years old. Something's going wrong. And, and I said, you know, at any moment I can die. I said, so something, and they just, oh man. And then I just say, well, you know, here's a perfection of yoga. And I give them my business card, the Swami business card, Bhakti Yoga Meditation, right? And on the back, it has a little caption from the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. Our very, Prabhupada, oh, genius. In the introduction to the Gita, Prabhupada says, just what is Bhagavad Gita? So you think, Bhagavad Gita, oh, it's a book, right? So he says, the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. So if you just say, what is this? I can say it's a bottle of water. But what is, what's the purpose? It's, it's to hold the water so that if someone gets thirsty, they can take a drink. So the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is to deliver mankind from the nations of material existence. And then he says, everyone, he says, we're all in the atmosphere he says, of not nations, non-existence. We're not meant to be in this environment. We're eternal spirit souls. We're not meant to be here. And so when they get that little caption and it says Bhagavad Gita as it is, that's the bell, right? Bhagavad Gita as it is, opportunity to purchase. Take advantage. Okay. Let me ask for a question. Okay, question. Well, I'll stop there at the bell. Any questions? Sir? <coughs> we have one, Krishnamurti, my close friend. Why does he say like us? Why does Because everyone around him believes. It says like us, meaning if I say like us, I'd probably say we. You know, we, us, you know, it's just like, my understanding of us, we, means that as a devotee, we understand we're, can, we're together with the super soul within, so we say we, because we're together with Krishna in the Paramatma form. And so us, like us, like us, like we, huh? it's a simple thing. It's kind of like sometimes somebody will ask, why do we say spirit soul? Why don't we just say soul? So spirit, so it's an emphasis that, okay, this is really like a real thing. It's not just an abstract thing. It's like spirit, soul. It's like double emphasized. I saw another hand, yes. Hey. How can you recognize? Well, my sister has a family photo album, and I can just look at the family photo album, and I can see my two-year-old, I can see my baby body, I can see my one-year-old body. So I can see all the different bodies just by looking at the pictures. And even when I come here to Vrindavan, I haven't been here for two years, and some people, I say, oh man, they changed. We can see the change. Obviously, you can see the change in your body. Um, but it, time is, this, it's an interesting topic because time has this influence where it goes at a certain pace and you don't really notice it when it's happening. But over, when there's big chunks of time past, then you really notice a difference. So we can notice just by taking a look. I hope I understood your question. Did I understand this question? <coughs> Anyone else? Okay, so thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.